Welcome to Servants of the Lord Ministries. My name is Dr. Keith Jenkins. I'm the International Coordinator for Servants of the Lord Ministries. Before I start my message today, let me share with you the commission of the ministry that was given to Joseph Hitchcock, the founder of Servants of the Lord Ministries, many years ago. The Lord said to him, I have children in every nation, and you have brothers and sisters whose hearts are crying out to me. They sought me for ministry, blessings and gifts. I've given them those things, and it's blessed them. But there's a part of their spirit that it never fulfilled, that is reserved for an intimate relationship with me. Now their hearts are crying out to me just for me. That is who I'm sending you to, because I don't want them to take the years it took you to get to me, because there was no one to show you how at the time. Servants of the Lord Ministries is a teaching and training ministry sent to the body of Christ to reach people with a heart after God. This message is for those who want to get to know Him, grow up in Him, and be ready for His appearing. Today I'll be speaking about being swift to hear. James said in James chapter 1 verse 19, this is in the book of James chapter 1, I'm reading verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. The word swift in Strong's is number 5036, of an uncertain affinity, meaning fleet that is figuratively prompt or ready, or swift. Noah Webster in 1828 defined the word fleet as one swift of pace, moving or able to move with rapidity, nimble, light and quick in motion, or moving with lightness and celerity, as a fleet horse or dog. Number two, moving with velocity, as fleet winds. Number three, light, superficially fruitful, or thin, not penetrating deep as in soil. Number four, skimming the surface. Under the pressure, the churches scattered in the persecution were losing their ability to hear. They could not control their speaking, and anger was manifesting. When anger manifests because you cannot hear, you know you are in the flesh. In Jerusalem, the Jews could hear God clearly, before the persecution started, under ordinary circumstances, but not in the diverse trials they were facing now. James told them to be swift to hear under pressure as issues would escalate otherwise. I have seen Joseph Hedgecock, the author of the book My Sheep Hear My Voice, go on high alert when tired or facing a trial. My response when I was in training was just to think about my own needs, like lack of sleep. I had to repent. If you know God loves you, you will decide to obey God before he gives you a direction. This is the only way you will be swift to hear and obey under pressure. Paul said in Romans 8 and verse 5, this is in the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. In the Amplified Bible Classic Edition, Romans 8 5 says, For those who are according to the flesh and are controlled by its unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit and are controlled by the desires of the Spirit set their minds and seek those things which gratify the Holy Spirit. Now that you are born again, you can ask and seek God with many yes and no questions using the witness of the Spirit and the peace of God. Your mind should be busy. It's either preoccupied with the things of the flesh or with the thoughts that the Spirit is bringing to your mind. If you're always anxious about your daily activities, then you're in the flesh. Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 6, this is in the Gospel of John chapter 3, I'm reading verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Those that start in the flesh are easily satisfied with earthly wisdom. You might prevent some difficulties and save some time with earthly wisdom, but you still have to follow Christ. You cannot follow Christ using earthly wisdom. Godly wisdom comes from 
living on the narrow way and pleasing him and keeping to his timetable. We read in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and 27. This is in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and reading verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. You were created in the image of God, made alive by the connection to God through his spirit. You were created with a body, soul and spirit. The Holy Spirit, through your human spirit, was supposed to direct your mind. Man began to consult his own mind and serve the desires of the flesh after he was separated from God through sin. We read in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 19. This is in the book of Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. You have a heavenly Father who loves you and created you so he could direct your mind through the Spirit. Adam had just been created, and he did not have any information stored in his mind. However, God named all the animals as Adam yielded his members to God to do what God wanted. Paul said in Romans chapter 6 and verse 19. This is in the book of Romans chapter 6. I'm reading verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity, unto iniquity. Even so, now yield your members, servants to righteousness, unto holiness. Modern computers were designed after the human mind, but they are just a dumb box. The computer will only do what you tell it to do. You might hit it and get angry, but it's not alive. The person operating the computer is the one that makes it look alive or intelligent. God will honour you for letting him use your mind, but he will not give you his glory, because he is the source of what is truly wise. Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, verses 2 to 4. This is in the book of Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading verse 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Verse 3. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. If you repented of dead works, you should be completely lifeless or dead without Christ giving you the impulses and initiative to do anything. This is how God made you in the beginning. Now through conviction you should delete out of the mind all things that need removing through repentance. The modern computers were designed after the human mind with a conscious part and a subconscious part. The subconscious part is for information that has been proven to work efficiently and used to form good habits. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 verses 7 and 8. This is John's Gospel, chapter 3, I'm reading verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Verse 8. The wind blows where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it comes and where it is going. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. You can be born again, but not born of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit directs your life, you are spiritual. If you start using your mind for what you want, then you're in the flesh. Being swift or fleet is the normal operating speed in the spiritual realm. Joseph Hedgecock, the author of the book My Sheep and My Voice, in his message once shared how some soldiers had to be ready in just one minute when the alarm was sounded. Minutemen were civilian colonists who independently organized to form militia companies, self-trained in weaponry, tactics, 
and military strategies from the American colonial partisan militia during the American Revolutionary War. They were known for being ready at a minute's notice, hence the name. God has a certain frequency at which he is transmitting his perfect will for your life. He knows what you need to do now. Your obedience needs to be instant, especially when you are facing a trial. By doing everything in his timing, you are tuning into his frequency. Paul said in Colossians chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. This is in the book of Colossians chapter 3. I'm reading verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 6. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. It is your responsibility to keep Jesus in charge and let him make the right decisions as Lord. He can be trusted because he died for you. Your feelings and emotions cannot be trusted. They can be very demanding and you must kill anything that seeks to take the place of Jesus in your life as Lord. Have no mercy. Paul said in Romans chapter 12 verses 2 and 3. This is Romans chapter 12. I'm reading verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. Release your faith into what God tells you to do consistently. Otherwise, the devil can elevate your mind and you will believe you have all the information in your natural carnal mind. Then you will listen to a wrong voice and become like the world again. When you try to believe the truth, it will not work because of the unbelief hindering your faith. The root of all unbelief in your life is a lie that you believe to be the truth. If you let the Holy Spirit bring thoughts to your mind and obey them, then your mind will be transformed. There are only two options for the mind. Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. This is in the book of Romans chapter 8. I'm reading verse 6. For to be kindly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You have to be honest about the state of your mind. You can have the peace of God that passes all understanding while others are using their accumulated earthly wisdom to make their own lives more comfortable. You will have peace and they will not. We read in Isaiah 55 verses 7 to 9. This is in the book of Isaiah chapter 55. I'm reading verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Verse 8 For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Verse 9 For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. One small decision is just as important as a big decision with God, and he should be Lord now, if you have repented of dead works. Practice asking God the small things first so that your mind is not idle. You are supposed to forsake your ways and your thoughts. If your first response to hearing what God wants is, oh no, that's too hard or difficult, repent. You are listening to your carnal mind. If you are able to hear God in difficult circumstances, rejoice because his kingdom is here now. His ways are higher. And you will see how his superior ways work in practice if you do not take over the Lordship. Before you came to Christ, you were Lord of your own life and making the decisions just like Satan, usurping yourself above God. This is the sin of Satan, so that makes you thoroughly wicked. Try to remove the I out of every sentence you write from now on, and you will realize you are still making statements without asking God. Jesus said to his disciples 
in John 14, verses 26 and 27. This is in John's Gospel, chapter 14, and reading verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You can change the way your mind works by responding immediately to conviction or revelation through the scriptures coming back to your mind. God should have priority, especially when you're busy. Keep a notebook handy to write down his thoughts. Stay in God's peace and do not get distracted through social media. If you are faithful to the conviction after salvation, you will hear his voice. One rich businessman complained to the evangelist Charles Finney that he could not hear the voice of the Lord. Finney responded by asking the man to listen to his conscience first and see what he needed to change. Afterwards, the man began hearing the voice of the Lord. Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 7. This is in the book of Romans chapter 8. I'm reading verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. For the sake of their own flesh, many in the church today believe that the carnal mind still has some eternal value. If his thoughts are consistently coming to your mind without you taking the initiative, then your mind is being renewed. Those following Christ are convinced the carnal mind is opposed to God and are consistently denying themselves and taking up their cross daily. God's ways do not make sense to the carnal mind. Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. This is in the book of Romans chapter 8 and reading verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In the book, The Guilted Prison, Revised Edition, in chapter 3 on Unseen Chains, on page 29, Joseph Hedgecott writes, When you habitually sin and yield to the flesh, satanic spirits gain access. Habitual sin in specific areas sends a signal to Satan. He sees your rebellion against God in specific areas. He then sends demonic spirits associated with your sins to entrap you. These spirits amplify the lust of your flesh and seduce you with deception. They tempt you to resist the work of the spirit that would bring you to repentance. In a sense, you move into a maximum security prison because satanic spirits control you. They intensify your bondage. If you want to be free, you must fight against the flesh and the satanic spirits that are attached to specific sins. One example of this would be someone who is addicted to alcohol or drugs. The devil also gains access to amplified rebellion, fear, anger, resentment, bitterness, depression, oppression, and many other sins. Today's addictions to electronic devices and social media are also influenced by him. If you're not overtly rebellious, but try to walk with God in spiritualized flesh, Satan will minister religious spirits to you. He will bind you with erroneous church doctrines, religious methods, and self-righteousness. You will follow the letter of the law instead of the leading of the Spirit. You will be quick to judge others and condemn yourself. Be honest and look at areas where you do hear God easily, and other areas where you take matters into your own hands. A higher level of pressure requires more grace, and God can provide this if you want to learn how to overcome. You will not hear a condemning voice from God saying, Why didn't you ask God everything? Under higher levels of pressure that you cannot handle. However, you do have a free will, so you can obey the dictates of the Spirit and abide. You will stay free from condemnation by giving your free will back to God and letting Him make all the decisions. It's no longer an issue of right and wrong, but now of the spirit or the flesh. 
We read in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. This is in the book of Genesis chapter 2, and we read verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest, thereof thou shalt surely die. God set boundaries for Adam, and he only had to obey one simple instruction in the garden. Instead, he chose to disobey for the sake of his wife in his own flesh. Jesus was not his first love. Jesus said in Luke fourteen twenty six and 27, this is in Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, I'm reading verse 26. If any man will come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Verse 27. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. In the book, My Sheep Hear My Voice, 2021 edition, in chapter 7 on counting the cost, on pages 82 and 83, Joseph Hedgecott writes, If you do not love God more than anything or anyone, including yourself, you are not totally surrendered to Him. Your heart must be yielded in every area. When you make decisions instead of asking God what to do, you neither deny yourself nor take up your cross to follow Jesus Christ. You are in sin, whether you admit it or not. It is not enough to deny yourself in areas of obvious rebellion, sins of commission. You must repent of the deceptions that lead you to believe you are right when you are actually wrong. The devil, as the highest ranking angel, was sent to help man obey the truth with conviction. God gave him these powers for good and not for evil. We read in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. This is in the book of Genesis chapter 3. I'm reading verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Verse 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Verse 4. And the servant said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. The word subtle in Strong's is number 6175. It's a passive participle of another word meaning cunning, usually in a bad sense, crafty, prudent, or subtle. This may seem an unfair contest between man and the devil. However, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Man now has a divine connection to the heart and mind of God through the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus did on the cross. This was God's plan from the beginning, and even the devil did not know about it. Now the devil is fighting an even bigger battle with all those who are led by the Spirit. Jesus was speaking in Luke. Chapter 9, verses 22 to 26. This is Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, reading verse 22. Saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be slain and be raised the third day. Verse 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me. Verse 24. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Verse 25. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world, and lose himself, or be a castaway? Verse 26. 
For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words and of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. The solution for sin is for man to give his free will back to God and become a robot for Jesus. You will lose your soul by becoming a robot for Jesus, but you will get your soul back again with him in charge. He loves you and he knows you better than you know yourself. He knows how you are designed to function and perform under pressure, despite the mess that the devil created in this world. Man without God is still making the wrong choices since the fall of man, based on wisdom that appeals to his flesh. Jesus died to pay the price for every sin to be cleansed so that man could learn from his mistakes. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. This is in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 2. Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Man was created in the image of God to function as an empty vessel. It was the devil who tempted Eve with a lot of unnecessary information from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Christians often identify the knowledge of evil as being wrong, but they do not see the wisdom gained through the knowledge of good as wrong. We read in Psalms 46 verses 8 to 11. This is in the Psalms. Chapter 46, I'm reading verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations has he made in the earth? Verse 9. He maketh wars to cease, and unto the end of the earth he breaks the bow, and cuts the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Verse 10. Be still and know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Verse 11. The Lord of hosts is with us, and the God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. In the Message Bible, Psalm 46, 8 to 11 says, Attention all, see the marvels of God. He plants flowers and trees all over the earth, bans war from pole to pole, breaks all the weapons across his knee. Step out of the traffic. Take a long, loving look at me, your high God, above politics, above everything. Jacob wrestling God fights for us. God of angel armies protects us. In the Living Bible, Psalm 46, 10 to 11 says, Stand silent, know that I am God, and I will be honored by every nation in the world. Commander of the heavenly armies is here among us. He, the God of Jacob, has come to rescue us. Your heart and mind should be still and not listening to conspiracy theories in these last days when the world is passing away. Those who are submitted to him are on the winning side, getting ready for his appearing. If you are making the decisions with your mind, then you are in pride and carnal. If you are humble, then Jesus is Lord. When you move into pride, you put yourself on the losing side. Without humility, the grace stops, and then you will experience discomfort and go through many unnecessary battles. You will believe lies again and get contaminated with unbelief. We read in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. This is in the book of Proverbs chapter 14 and reading verse 12. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Let the Holy Spirit control you and be quick in your obedience, especially when you're going through a trial or difficulty. By using your own discernment, you will fall into the ways that seem right. You have to fight not to be destroyed by lies. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 12 to 14. This is 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm reading verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, 
and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Verse 13. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickens all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Verse 14. That thou keepest this commandment without spot and unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. For more information on the fight of faith, read chapter 14, The Battle for Your Mind, in the book Wake Up, Time is Running Out, Volume 2, Growing Up Spiritually, by Joseph Hedgecock. You are brought out of the slave market of sin to be used by God as a vessel for His glory. Things in this world you hold on to will make you lose your grip on eternal life. Good is the enemy of best. Good works that you do for the sake of your flesh that God did not direct you to do will keep the flesh alive. You have to fight to stop the devil using your mind by denying yourself and taking up your cross daily. Put on the same mind that Christ had, submitting himself to the Father. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. This is in the book of Philippians chapter 2, and reading verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Verse 7. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Do not let the fear of suffering stop you from fulfilling your destiny. The new operating system requires you to be uncompromisingly righteous and trust God in complicated situations. You have to be prepared to suffer for righteousness' sake in this world. You will need to stay in connection with God the whole time to know what to do next. We read in John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 21. This is John's Gospel, chapter 20, I'm reading verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Jesus is looking to send out those who will follow him consistently. His sayings are rarely accepted in the church today. Those who are perishing will not understand why you don't just do what you want when you want. Paul also said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verses 1, and reading to verse 9. This is 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honour, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Verse 2. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Verse 4. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Verse 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Verse 8. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Servants were told to be satisfied with their living conditions for the sake of the gospel. They were to use humble circumstances as an opportunity to grow rapidly and give the good confession to their earthly masters. 
daily food and a small amount of clothes was enough in the early church and Timothy was told not to associate with prosperity preachers advocating earthly gain as evidence of godliness. No one was to seek a better standard of living until they had learned contentment in their present financial circumstances. This is not taught today, so everyone is doing what they want and then asking God's blessings without repentance from dead works. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, this is in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, I'm reading verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. You will never go on into perfection if you only repent of bad works that are obviously evil. There is the sin of commission and the sin of omission that you will find through keeping a journal of your own activities. Those who are not working towards God's standards when Jesus comes back will be left behind. You may not be perfect, but that is no excuse for more disobedience. One more sin does not make the situation acceptable. Bad fruit manifesting in your life under some extraordinary pressure is God's invitation to get to the root of sin early and repent deeply. Just confess your sin and start seeking righteousness in complicated situations. We read in the book of Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. This is in the book of Isaiah chapter 59 and reading verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened and it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Everyone tracing the root of sin can go back to a time and place when God was speaking to them clearly by grace. From that point on, then, if sin and iniquity got in, that is the reason for a breakdown in the communication. James said in James chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. This is in the book of James chapter 1. I'm reading verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the ingrafted word which is able to save your souls. Verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. In the Living Bible, James 1, 21 to 22 says, So get rid of all that is wrong in your life both inside and outside, and humbly be glad for the wonderful message we have received, for it is able to save our souls as it takes hold of our hearts, and remember it's a message to obey, not just to listen to, so don't fool yourselves. When I first heard Joseph Hedgecott, the author of the book, My Sheep Hear My Voice, shared that he made the decision to obey before God spoke to him. I thought that that was dangerous and even foolish. I believed it was necessary first to think about what God said before obeying. I did not see meekness as the key to swiftly hearing. The carnal mind will betray you and cause you to disobey if you start thinking about what God is directing you to do. Jesus was speaking in Matthew 18 and verse 3. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, I'm reading verse 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. I have heard carnal Christians with a confidence in the flesh argue that they would do what God says if only they could hear what he wanted them to do. Those who think like this are deceiving themselves. God is speaking all the time. Jesus said in Luke 14, verses 33 to 36. This is Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, starting in verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all, that he has. He cannot be my disciple. 
Verse 34. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savour, wherewith shall it be seasoned? Verse 35. It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. And he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Hearing God swiftly in complicated situations makes you salt and light in this dark world controlled by Satan. You have to forsake all to follow Christ. The church scattered in the persecution were the salt sent out, but they were becoming spiritually sluggish, looking at those around them with worldly wisdom, having a better standard of living. David said in the Psalms, chapter 37, verse 1, this is in the Psalms 37, I'm reading verse 1. A Psalm of David, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. The Jews were hearing under pressure, but not consistently applying what they had learned from the apostles' teaching. They had just placed the teaching on top of a shallow foundation. They could not rejoice in all circumstances and were having second thoughts about godly wisdom being the priority. James said in James chapter 1, verses 1 and reading to verse 8. This is James chapter 1, starting in verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Verse 5. If any man of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that gives to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Verse 7. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If you cannot hear his voice clearly in complicated situations, it's because you lack godly wisdom. Godly wisdom is given to those who are rejoicing and not in a hurry to change their circumstances. You will not receive anything if you start doubting God's motives to give you a good foundation. A lack of godly wisdom is the reason you get angry and react. James says in James chapter 3, and I'm reading verse 6 to 18. This is James chapter 3, starting verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And is it set on fire of hell? Verse 7, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and have been tamed of mankind. Verse 8, but the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Verse 9, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Verse 10, Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things are not so to be. Verse 11. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Verse 12. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no foundation both yield salt water and fresh. Verse 13. Who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Verse 14. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. Verse 15. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Verse 16. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first 
pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Verse 18. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in the peace of them that make peace. Some were speaking things contrary to the truth in diverse situations, exposed to nations where they were scattered. They were becoming like the world, listening to natural wisdom for the sake of earthly gain. You should be able to hear and obey God immediately, if you are mature, and be a source of peace to others in troubled times. Jesus said in Matthew 25, verses 1 and 2, this is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, and reading verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Verse 2. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Use worldly wisdom for a limited period of time because it's devilish and God has his own. Those serving two masses prefer earthly wisdom for the sake of their flesh, but that leads to envying and strife. Godly wisdom is gained from a life dedicated to God being the servant of all on the narrow way. With godly wisdom, you will not become spiritually sluggish. We read in Isaiah 6, verses 4 to 11. This is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. I'm starting in verse 4. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Verse 5. Then said I, Woe is me! For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Verse 7. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this had touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, send me. Verse 9. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Verse 10. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Verse 11, Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the peoples without man, and the land be utterly desolate. The word undone in Strong's is number 1820, a primitive root, to be dumb or silent, hence to fail or perish, transitively to destroy, cease, be cut down or off, to be destroyed or brought to silence or be undone utterly. Instead of being healed through repentance from dead works, the last generation of Christians are corrupted with teachings on prosperity and blessing in the church through false prophets. Isaiah realized he had become like the people around him. He was even convicted that his lips were unclean, calling Jesus Lord. He was ready to go again to the lost sheep of Israel and tell them the truth. Church leaders are not there to tell his people what they want to hear. They're supposed to be watchmen who can warn the people that they're on a way that seems right. We have the Holy Spirit, but the church is asleep using their minds instead because they do not like conviction. Jesus said in Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30. This is in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, and reading verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Verse 26. But when the blade was sprung up 
and brought forth fruit. Then appeared the tares also. Verse 27. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then had it tares? Verse 28. He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up? Verse 29. But he said, Nay, least while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Verse 30. Let both grow together unto the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. The tares are those born again through a word sown by an enemy of the cross, offering salvation without making Jesus the first love and Lord of all. In this parable, both groups look very much alike. They are both hearing the Lord as well, by grace, but there's a difference. The tares in every church are easily satisfied with earthly wisdom. I'm amazed at how fast some people can hear God when there is something that they like or desire involved. It might be their favorite food, like an ice cream or some other activity along the way. They get an answer from God quickly and glad when they do not have to go through even a little bit of suffering. Jesus said in Matthew seven, twenty-one. This is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, and reading verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. The good seed in the hearts of those born again seeking righteousness do his perfect will using godly wisdom. Someone with godly wisdom and insight would not be in a hurry to remove or repair something that is causing them to acknowledge God in all their ways under pressure. They can rejoice in all circumstances. A foolish believer would do something quickly if it meant he could get back to his comfortable lifestyle as soon as possible. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 10 to 12. And this is in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, I'm reading verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Verse 11. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Verse 12. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The word slothful in Strong's is number 3576. It comes from another word which basically means sluggish. That is literally lazy or figuratively stupid, dull or slothful. You become spiritually dull or sluggish if you do not rely on the promises of God by faith coming to your mind on the narrow way. If you do not know what God wants you to do, then ask him what he does not want you to do first. This will remove the options that are more convenient for your flesh. You will find out what is possible with God with the options that remain. Paul said in Romans chapter 8 verse 36 to 39. This is in the book of Romans, chapter 8, starting in verse 36. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, or nor things present, nor things to come. Verse 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul was not spiritually sluggish. He was on the narrow way under some pressure. He loved the truth. He was learning from his mistakes, even if it meant he had to be corrected and repent. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I'm reading verse 11. 
and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Verse 12, that you may walk honestly towards them that are without, that you may have lack of nothing. You will not have time to look at anyone else's faults if you are seeking righteousness and working out your own salvation in fear and trembling. You will keep a journal to examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. You should be doing everything honestly in God's timing. Also, by using your hands, you are not relying too much on earthly wisdom and modern technology. You don't have to explain to anyone else that you are living by faith. Those with little or no faith will be convicted by the way you live day to day, getting God's provision, seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 32. This is Matthew's gospel, chapter 6, and starting in verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for the body, what you should put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much better than they? Verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Verse 28. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Verse 29. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Verse 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? Verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father know that ye have need of all these things. God is the transmitter, and if you have the Holy Spirit, you have a new nature inside of you, which is the receiver. Being born again by the Holy Spirit is a confirmation that you have his new operating system, and you need to use it. Before being born again, you use your mind to make decisions swiftly as Lord of your own life. Now when a thought comes to your mind with the new nature, you can form a new habit that swiftly obeys the Spirit. God can use your mind with the same swiftness with the new operating system, but you have to stop consulting your mind like you did before. To direct you consistently, you must believe He directs you because He loves you. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 24. This is in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading verse 17. This I say therefore, and testify to the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. Verse 18. Having the understand darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Verse 19. Who being past feeling, have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. Verse 21. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The devil appeals to the vanity of the mind of man and elevates it so it no longer appears helpless without God. The devil is still working the same way today, destroying lives in those 
who give the desires of the flesh their immediate response. Carnal Christians gather earthly wisdom to make their lives more comfortable and do not seek genuine righteousness and true holiness. Jesus needs to be Lord of what you read, what you listen to and think about. Only God can prepare you for the unexpected. Your response time to God is your responsibility. You're either spiritual or you are carnal. If you're still sinning and easily tempted by deceitful lusts of the flesh, then you're still operating in the vanity of your own mind. By weighing up one decision with another and deciding what is the best way forward, based on your limited knowledge, you are still Lord of your own life. Consistent holiness in all trials and difficulty is the fruit that the spirit of your mind is completely renewed. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 8 to 14. This is Ecclesiastes chapter 12, starting verse 8. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. Verse 9. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge, yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. Verse 10. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Verse 11. The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the masses of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. Verse 12. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Everyone will have to answer to God for the times they missed an opportunity to obey because they were carnally minded. The biggest habit you have since you were born on this earth is using your carnal mind to make decisions. This habit can be broken. With the Holy Spirit and the new nature, you can make a fresh start trusting God with all your heart. John said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. This is 1 John chapter 5, I'm reading verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. If you're keeping his commands, then it will leave you little or no time to do what you want, when you want. His commands will include things like going to bed at a set time every day, with few exceptions. Those who are still puffed up in their mind believe knowledge and earthly wisdom is enough for the sake of their flesh and they do not need his commands. The commands of God appear grievous to those who are carnal. They even say God gave you a brain, and he expects you to use it. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. This is in the book of Romans chapter 8, and reading verse 13. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Do not be like the world, or you will never fulfill your destiny. Even if you humble yourself for the sake of a godly task, this is not enough. At best you will become lukewarm. You should see your life changing in terms of a better response time to God's directions by the Spirit daily, and in your ability to hear God and get the details as well. Your obedience, if you are a mature son, should be instant. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 to 11. This is in the book of Philippians chapter 3, and read verse 8. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Verse 9, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10, That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. 
Verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul wanted to reach a level that he could hear God consistently in the kind of pressure that Christ was going through all the way to the cross. He wanted to be able to hear swiftly and overcome the flesh. He was seeking a righteousness that would hold and not compromise under the pressure, but that meant it also had to be tested. He believed that God would empower his mortal body through his faith in God and win Christ as a result. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34. This is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, and reading verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The religions of the world are mostly centered around man's earthly needs and how to keep evil away. Christianity is the opposite. You are not to be kept from evil, but seek godly wisdom instead. You were told not even to think about your life. The priority under the pressure was watching out for dead works trying to manifest while following Christ. James said in James chapter 1, verse 26. This is in the book of James chapter 1. Read verse 26. If any man among you seems to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, that man's religion is vain. The word religion in Strong's is number 2356. It comes from a derivative of another word meaning ceremonial observance, religion, worshipping. In the Living Bible, James 126 says, Anyone who says he's a Christian but doesn't control his sharp tongue is just fooling himself, and his religion isn't worth much. Some in the church have learned how to pray for maybe five to ten minutes, explaining the problem in public prayer to God, and then say amen. This kind of prayer the world listens to because it makes sense and elevates the calm mind. John said in 1 John chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. This is 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Verse 5. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. Verse 6. For we are of God, and he that knows God hears us, and he that is not of God hears not us. Hereby know ye the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. God has an answer for every situation. And the evidence is in the fact that he answers those who pray according to his will. The world will not accept the wisdom of the cross and believe it's not wrong to serve two masters. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 verses 5 to 7. This is Matthew's gospel chapter 6 starting in verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, and they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Verse 7. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. In the book, My Sheep Hear My Voice, 2021 edition, in chapter 5, on preparing to hear the Lord, on page 70, Joseph Hedgecott writes, Unfortunately, most Christians give God their list of needs and then hang up the phone before he says anything. You need to do more listening than talking. It is wonderful to hear the Lord's instructions regarding a problem. He knows exactly what to do about every situation. There may be conditions to receive what you have requested. So first ask the Lord if there are requirements you must meet to receive his provision. The word Amen means so be it. Carnal Christians do not take time to listen because they only have faith for communication going one direction. They also reserve the right to use their minds 
after they've presented a request to God to make an educated decision instead for the sake of their flesh. If you believe he will answer immediately, he will. If you believe he will answer you over a period of time, then he will do this. As your faith is, so be it unto you. If you only have doubts, then he will not answer at all until you repent of your unbelief. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 6. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Verse 2. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Verse 3. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. Verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Verse 5. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Verse 6. Now these things were our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Paul saw his life like those Jews passing through the wilderness heading for the promised land. There were some benefits like God's protection. In the desert there was no obvious worldly temptation. However, Paul concluded that lusting after the things of the world destroyed God's people. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and reading verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Those scattered in the persecution had no finances to draw upon. They had to focus on what was really necessary to find food and shelter for their own lives every day. The Father is supposed to be your source every day. He demonstrated this with his chosen people in the desert. The nation of Israel flourished in the desert for 40 years without man's help. They had water and food the whole time. They just had to be in the right place at the right time. They had to hear, trust and obey. Unbelief stopped one generation from entering the promised land at the first attempt. Unbelief will also stop you from being ready for his appearing. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verses 9 to 15. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, and reading verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Verse 12, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Verse 13, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. Verse 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 15, But if you forgive not men their trespasses, Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. This is the correct manner of prayer for those following Jesus. When you turn up for prayer, listen and do not give God instructions. Ask God for daily bread and see his directions for daily provision as a confirmation that you are in the Spirit. The priority is to stay in the Spirit with God all the time through the Spirit so as to not fall into the devil's snare. If you do not forgive others, also you will lose your connection to God as well. We read in Isaiah 55, 1 to 3. This is in the book of Isaiah 55, and reading verse 1. Lo, every one that's thirsty, come ye to the waters, and he that had no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money. And without price. Verse 2. Whereby do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. 
Verse 3. Incline your ear and come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. No, Webster in 1828 defines swift as 1. Moving a great distance or over a large space in a short time. Moving with celerity or velocity. Fleet, rapid, quick, speedy. We say swift winds, a swift stream, swift lightings, swift motion, swift as thought. A foul swift of wing, a man swift of foot. Swift is applicable to any kind of motion. Number two, ready or prompt. And three, speedy that comes without delay. Swift describes the proper operation of man to hear with the Holy Spirit and obey. Decide to obey before he speaks so you do not get entangled trying to make the decision yourself from your flesh. If your faith is correctly placed in him, you are like a little child. You can operate like the wind because you know he loves you. You are always ready, on alert, to obey God instantly as he directs with any sudden change of direction as well. You will lose that liberty by going back to the flesh and accepting your righteousness based on the law. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. This is in the book of Galatians chapter 5 and reading verse 1. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In Galatia, some were settling for an outward form of righteousness for the sake of persecution. They were not willing to endure and seek righteousness in the situation. Paul had to confront them because they were not standing fast in the liberty that had been given to obey the Spirit. God is never the problem. His response to sin and iniquity is consistent. The problem is in those who think they can serve two masters. They are spiritually sluggish. They are full of opinions and rights and wrongs they use to make decisions rather than cling to the cross. The response time to simple instructions from those who have a position of authority in your life should be swift too. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 to 21. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Verse 21. If a man therefore purges himself from these he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. The word noble in Strong's is number 5092. It comes from another word which means a value, that is, money paid, or concretely or collectively valuables, by analogy, esteem, especially of the highest degree, or the dignity itself, honour, precious, price, sum. The word ignoble in Strong's is number 819. It comes from another word which means infamy. That is, subjectively, comparative indignity. Objectively, disgrace, dishonor, reproach, shame, vile. The word purge in Strong's is number 1571, which comes from some other word which means to cleanse thoroughly or purge out. God is no respecter of persons. God cannot use your life for noble purposes if you keep making excuses for using your mind and disobeying the spirit of truth for the sake of your flesh. God can use those who are self-seeking for ignoble tasks. You may end up with a ministry of sandpaper for those in the rest of the body of Christ who are getting ready for his appearing. You get left behind while they learn to overcome tribulations because of the extra trials they had to endure because of you. Purge yourself from listening to your flesh and he can use you for every good work. Peter said in Second Peter 2 verses 15 and reading to verse 22. This is Second Peter chapter 2 reading verse 15. 
which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bezor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, verse 16, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet, verse 17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. Verse 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. Verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Verse 22. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Balaam's donkey saved the prophet from the angel sent to stop him. The prophet was hearing God but loved money, serving two masters. Such preachers are vain, empty and entangled with this world. They cannot help you. There should only be one reason you want to hear God and that is because you love him. A quick or immediate response is necessary in the spirit in all decisions if you are going to lead the church. God provides for you if you will become a new creation, responding consistently to the word of truth and conviction. James said in James chapter 1, verses 13 to 18. This is James chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. Verse 14. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Verse 15. Then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Verse 16. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow turning. Verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God is not tempting you because he cannot be tempted. Even the devil is not the problem. You are the problem if you are listening to a wrong voice because you want something in this world. The truth is you deceive yourself from a form of Christianity that does not involve an immediate response to the spirit of truth. In the Living Bible, James 1, 13 to 8, it says, And remember, when someone wants to do wrong, it's never God who's tempting him. For God never wants to do wrong, and never tempts anyone else to do it. Temptation is the pull of man's own evil thoughts and wishes. These evil thoughts lead to evil actions and afterwards to the death penalty from God. So don't be misled, dear brothers. But whatever is good and perfect comes to us from God, the creator of all light, and he shines forever without change or shadow. And it was a happy day for him when he gave us our new lives through the truth of his word, and we became, as it were, the first children in his new family. When God created some of the largest reptiles and most significant animals for his glory, man must have looked very insignificant in the beginning. Man was not the biggest or the smallest of God's creatures. We read in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. This is in the book of Genesis chapter 1 
I'm reading verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. The word created in Strong's is number 1254, a primitive root, absolutely to create, qualified to cut down a wood, select, feed as a formative process. Choose, create, be a creator, cut down, dispatch, do, or make fat. The word image in Strong's is number 6754, from an unused root meaning to shade, a phantom, that is figuratively illusion, resemblance, having a representative figure, especially an idol, image, or vain show. God has never dominated man, expected man to have dominion over creation in the same way. Man was designed as a vessel of honour, not to be contaminated with his own opinions. He was designed and created for a special work on the earth to select, feed, dispatch and serve the rest of creation as an empty vessel by his spirit. If you consult your own mind, you'll be like the devil. The whole of creation is still waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God when man will fulfil a divine role and serve and lead the rest of creation. Man cannot serve with a carnal mind and hear the right voice fast enough for all the needs of creation. In the beginning, there was a direct link between God and man. Adam was just created, and before sin separated him from God, without thinking, man just named all the animals as God brought them before him. This is the way the mind was working then, when Adam was only one day old. We read in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 8. This is Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Verse 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Verse 8. It shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. Those with a confidence in the flesh are blind spiritually. They make decisions based on earthly wisdoms and cling to this for the sake of their flesh. There are issues changing operating systems from the flesh to the spirit. But don't give up. Everything is new when you come to Christ, including the way your mind works. Man was never designed to lean to his own understanding or consult his mind. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 to 8. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 2 starting in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse 3. And I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. Verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Verse 5. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. Verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Verse 8. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If you want to hear, get to know and follow Jesus then I can recommend this book, My Sheep, Hear My Voice by Joseph Hedgecock. If you want to make a fresh start, get on the narrow way. Sow in the Spirit daily, experience full salvation and freedom through regular repentance. Then I can recommend the book, Wake Up, Time is Running Out, Volume 1, Foundations of Spiritual Maturity by Joseph Hedgecock. Do not accept a counterfeit version of Christianity based on religious works where you do not have to deny yourself daily and trust God. 
if you know that you've resisted the truth and want to know why, then I can recommend the book The Guilty Prison, Revised Edition by Joseph Hedgecock. Today I've shared with you a new way of operating. Some of you have not realized that God is speaking all the time. He is transmitting His perfect will for every child of His in every situation. And some of the situations you're going through right now are complicated because God put you there to be salt and light. I appeal to you right now, humble yourself and choose to have a new kind of wisdom, a wisdom that enables you to answer the most complicated situations with God's solutions. They won't make any sense to man. And maybe in this period of time, many will come to Christ because they see that you still have peace and joy. I want you to believe in godly wisdom. When Paul came preaching, he didn't come with that which most people would like. He came with the truth. Let me pray with you right now. Father in heaven, those who've been listening to this message and you have been speaking to them about a new life, living, controlled by your Spirit, I pray that they will begin to listen to your voice, focus on what you're telling them, discard that social media and those other things that are distracting them, and make a journal of the things they need to make every day so that their lives can be controlled by your Spirit. Their obedience will be swift because you are their first love and they're willing to obey you instantly in everything. Father, I'm praying for them that they will be salt and light to those in this world that are perishing and that God use them mightily in these last days, in Jesus' name. You can find a summary of the scriptures used in today's message below the video, either written out or via a link to a website. Our contact details will follow at the end of this message. God bless you and thank you for listening.